Hey, what's up everyone? So sort of a, not a quick video today, but sort of a straightforward video. It's not a top 10 list. Instead, it's basically just a list of about 10 random items in no particular order that I think constitute some of the most impossible or hard to reach um, EU collector's items out there. Um, hard to reach because some might be available, but they're just so inflated in the secondary market that they're basically out of reach for everyone, right? Um, I've done videos on most of these things, uh, so you can refer back to some of that. Maybe I'll put some links down below. But I think to kick it off, I think the first thing that always comes to mind, something that for years for me before I tracked one down was sort of a holy grail, is Dig Magazine. Uh, the infamous Dig Magazine, Dig being a uh, children's archaeology magazine um, from the late 90s that contained a short story, Lost City of Tatooine. I made a digital version, digital scan of it last year, passed it on to StarWarsTimeline.net, who has it on their site for anyone who wants to read who hasn't been able to track it down, because for years prior, prior to that, to my knowledge, there was no digital version available, although you could find the text, right? But you couldn't find some of the images and illustrations alongside it as well. But um, it's a, actually a really good story, but it's sort of a random one-off. You don't really need anything else from the Dig Archaeology magazine except for that one issue and that one story, but it's worthwhile. It's worthwhile tracking down. I hope you guys can check it out. Uh, but it's also still highly sought after by collectors because it's one of those nagging things that, and I felt the same way too before finding it several years ago, that it's sort of, you, you could get everything you could possibly imagine, but there would be this one thing, this one tiny little thing that would always evade you because it's so obscure. There's probably tons of people who have this magazine somewhere in their collection or like, you know, missing in their house, stuffed under a couch somewhere or something, right? From decades ago and just don't know about its value. This is the paradox of something being so scarce. It's not out there on the secondary market with those inflated prices inducing more people into the market to supply their own for others to buy, right? So it's a it's an unfortunate problem and I'm, people have offered hundreds of dollars for that and uh, unfortunately I'll, I'll never let it go but it's one reason why I wanted to sort of liberate it by at least making it digitally available. Um, for anyone who wants to read. But it's worth tracking down. And again, for me, it was a holy grail item. I could not believe how excited I was when I eventually did find it. And particularly because I found it for about $1.25. So not bad. So actually less than original cover price. Um, the second thing that I will add to this list of like impossible or hard to find items are things that I don't think are super crucial. Um, in fact, some of these things you really don't need if what you're primarily interested in is just sort of understanding more of the story and the lore, right? But if you are a completist and you want absolutely everything EU, right, then you need them. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about the Episode 1 and Episode 2 Adventures and Adventures game books. Now, this is something that Scholastic produced, part of a larger package of, yeah, you, I think this was offered primarily to schools. You'd see them advertised in the old Star Wars kids magazines of the day, Um there were two sorts of things primarily that you refer to when you're talking about the episode one, episode two adventures. On the one hand, there was a short little book that contained a little bit of a story and a setup for sort of a role playing game that you could play. And the second thing, the game book, sort of a corresponding game book in each case, is literally just a set of rules and activities and various things like that. It really doesn't contain any content or lore relevant to the EU timeline. But again, if you're going to get the one, it's kind of fun to have the other. They do sort of relate to each other in that way. And if you were buying them originally, you would have gotten them together anyway. So most people sort of, to the extent that they, they have them, you know, if they were students at the time buying stuff from Weekly Reader and Scholastic, you just had them if you held on to them. There's no reason to get rid of the game book, right? Even though the game books themselves are insanely expensive in some cases, what I found in most, in most instances is that you're able to track down a lot of the episode one and episode two adventure stories as well as game books for about the first half of those runs. And I think in each case there were something like 12, 13, 14, 15 sort of editions in each case. You know, about 15 episode one adventures, 15 episode one game books, and roughly the same with, with episode two. It's the last couple of um, editions in each case that are basically impossible to find or hundreds of dollars, just absurdly in my opinion, uh, on eBay. So titles like the final battle, I think, Pod Race to Freedom. These things are just super hard to find. The thing that's really frustrating about these Episode 1 and Episode 2 adventures, again, as I say, the game book portion of it is really not necessary. But again, if you're a completist, it's go ahead and pick it up. But the 
they're, they're really, they're, I think the, the thing that's true about this and lots of things EU is that the real struggle is ever finding a complete set. You know, most people have some of them, they probably lost others, maybe they didn't keep up with the game, they didn't buy the whole package. So, um, you know, you're going to you're gonna have to buy multiple lots on eBay or wherever else you find this sort of stuff and just hope that you eventually have an overlapping set of um, both episode one, episode two adventures. But I mean, I've, I, I was not, you know, of the weekly reader scholastic age when that stuff came out. I had to buy that stuff on the secondary market. Um, and I paid a hell of a lot of money for some stuff that I knew going in wasn't really relevant, but I still had to have those game books. And uh, I don't regret it because I'm a completist. And if you are too, it's just good luck, happy hunting. Uh, let me know if you ever find the complete set. It's definitely worth tracking down, definitely worth buying, just depending on how much they're asking. And unfortunately, they do they do ask a lot. I think um, in kind of a related vein, I think the third thing that I, I'll throw out here is the, um, the Star Wars Adventure Journals from the West End Games era. Now, the good thing is a lot of those contained stories that eventually get published later and collected, like in the Bantam era Tales books, which is good if you're interested just primarily in the stories. But if you love little West End games, if you're a role player yourself, you want those journals. Um, the real trick here is ever finding a full run all for, you know, all, all at once, right? I've, I've almost never seen that. Um, and the individual issues that are available are just always just super expensive, unfortunately. And I've really noticed over the last decade they're rising in price like by the day. Um, I mean, it's going to take you thousands of dollars if you can even track down the entire set, which is really unfortunate. Um, now, again, like a lot of these things, they're available digitally online for anyone who's just interested in reading. But if you're a collector, you're trying to hunt this stuff down, um, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. And I think that particularly with the full run, and I think that that's just... That's true of most Star Wars EU stuff, right? Anything that's part of a series, if you're looking for it now and you're on eBay or Amazon or Half Price Books or wherever you get your you know, stuff on the secondary market, finding full runs is really always going to be the issue. And I think you know, sort of just the broad category of full runs, that's really constitutes almost its own sort of, you know, things that are impossible to find, right? You know, whether you're talking about Star Wars missions or, you know, uh, Jedi Quest or anything that's a anything that's a run. You know, finding the full run at one go at a reasonable price is always going to be really tricky. Um, okay, the next item, the fourth, the fourth up here, um, another broad category, and it's basically just um, the more obscure hardcover science fiction book club editions, right? There's a bunch. There's there's too many to show here. I've got a couple just as an example. I mean, of course, you know, I've I've got this. This is the science fiction book club edition of this book. It's my favorite book in the EU. So I've got it in every possible edition. Uh, the audio, the original paperback, the paperback with the Legends title, the uh, um, and, and this. This is the only hardcover version of it. There wasn't a there wasn't a, a normal size hardcover. But you know you got to pick this up. It's kind of fun to have. Science Fiction Book Club back in the day was an important place to find a lot of really cool Star Wars stuff, and the only place in some instances to find hardcover editions that weren't available, sort of in the mainline market. So and here's just a few that are that are. Uh, exceedingly sort of rare and hard to find, particularly in good edition. So here's the hardcover of Scourge. Um, basically in mint edition, I was really, really lucky to track this down. I wasn't a part of science fiction book club towards the end of the EU, so I had to find this stuff sort of after the fact, and I was very fortunate to do so. And you can sort of see this sort of the state that you'll find some of this stuff in. I mean, this was a little torn here, but I was still happy to get it, the hardcover science fiction book club of Shadow Games. And here's just another example, The Last Jedi. Also kind of beat up, unfortunately, but still kind of a cool thing to have. You know, I've got everything that's available, science fiction book club in the Star Wars world, including actually other franchises as well. Um, they did a lot of good stuff with um, putting omnibuses together for different like Star Trek novels and stuff like that. I think there's some science fiction book club stuff for like Babylon 5. There's a lot of really neat stuff. So it, it was it was a cool thing while it lasted, at least for the Star Wars run. Although now that the EU is over, I don't really have much of an interest in maintaining my membership in those sorts of clubs, but it's kind of cool to get this stuff. And these things are obviously highly sought after. A lot of people prefer just to have the hardcovers. In a lot of cases, this is the only way to make that happen. It was true also with the larger runs like, you know, New Jedi Order and Legacy of the Force and things where where the mainline um, direct market wasn't supplying hardcovers for every issue often science fiction book club would step in and do that so there's you know there's a world in which for instance as 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 is true with my collection you can have every say new jedi order book and hardcover it's just that some have to be the science fiction book club those are rare they're more expensive harder to find and harder to find at a reasonable price um the next one 
next item on the list here um, is the Clone Wars season one comic. Now, um, this is something that was first made available at Celebration 5 in 2010 in Orlando. Now, I was there, and I was so frustrated to find years after the fact. This is something that I was really only aware of, I think as late as like 2015 maybe, that it even existed. I was so frustrated. I was at that that conference. I was at that celebration. I did not see this anywhere. Maybe it was already sold out. I don't know. I don't know what booth was selling it. Maybe the Dark Horse booth. I just don't know. I couldn't believe that I missed out on that, particularly because even, even in 2015, not that long after the the discontinuation when some of the the market really started to heat up for people trying to gobble up the old stuff to put their collections together before it sort of disappeared forever. I couldn't believe how how um, bad the prices were starting to become. The the book actually came with two really beautiful posters. And the posters themselves at the time just individually were selling in some cases. Well, I shouldn't say selling. They were being priced at like a hundred bucks a pop. I don't know if they've ever sold, but it was clearly pretty intimidating. You really got the sense you wouldn't ever find this. And so I decided to sort of hunt around a little bit and realize that it was actually co-published, um, not just by Dark Horse and, you know, and with the, you know, the permission of, of Lucasfilm, but also um, a smaller publisher who I looked up and discovered that on their website all these years ago, they still had a bunch of overstock. I couldn't believe it. And so as an experiment, I bought a copy and it came with the posters for 25 bucks, brand new. And so I bought a couple of more and I was able to give them away over the last couple of years. And unfortunately now, um, they've run out of stock. And I, I made a video on it years ago and I begged people in there with links to go ahead and buy this. This is not a joke, right? Go and buy this, this is the real deal. And unfortunately the, it's just, it's, um, the best you could probably do is to maybe buy one of the copies used without the posters for like 150 bucks. And that's really unfortunate. Um, again, a lot of stuff's available digitally online in various places. It originally appeared online as, um, as some web comics. And, uh, it's a shame there were, you know, in, as a web comic, we got more than just season one, but at this point it doesn't look like we'll ever get any sort of official release of anything beyond that season one. But the season one edition that does exist is a highly sought after, nearly impossible, certainly hard to find, in a sort of an inexpensive manner. All right, next on the list is something that is another sort of holy grail for me years ago. Um, I think it'd been holy grail for a long period of time. It was the Pizzazz Magazine. I've also done a video on this. Pizzazz Magazine is something that was published by Marvel in the very late 70s. Marvel had a whole history um, of experimenting with sort of like, it was a magazine. It's magazine size, it's not comic book size, but it's sort of supposed to just speak to pop culture in general. Um, different features about everything from comic books to like, I think there's a cover with like Fonzie from, what's the name of that show? Happy Days, whatever. Um, I think there's an issue with, it's been years since I looked at it, but like John Travolta from Greece and stuff. Anyway, uh, I got a video on it. You can check that out, but Pizazz did lots of different things. There's even actually a commercial for it that I have on my YouTube channel. Where I've curated some like EU related commercials. Um, but, um, it only lasted for about two years, but every issue had a very tiny snippet of a original Star Wars comic. Um, they didn't actually get a chance to complete the final one, which I think eventually later got completed, if I remember correctly, in Star Wars Weekly number 60. But then some of them got, if one even got like retitled, there was confusion for years about like what to even track down because one of the stories changed its name when it got republished. They got republished in something that itself became a bit of a sort of a hard to track down Holy Grail item for a number of years, again, pre-internet. Now it's not super easily available, but it's not super out of reach, which is a Marvel illustrated book. There's two volumes, and I've also done a video on that. Um, and it's uh, it's cool. It just basically, it's literally a book. Marvel was really keen on this back in the day, sort of early, mid eighties. Um, a lot of the comics were repackaged in what was basically like a, kind of like a mass market trade paperback size book. Um, of comics. It was really neat. And they did two for Star Wars. And it was the first one that collected some of these old pizzazz stories. The, the, the first one was always slightly harder to find. Again, now you can track it down. You just might have to pay a couple of extra bucks and you probably want, but it's not super hard to find. But pizzazz is something that, again, really falls into the category of good luck trying to find the full run. Do you need it? No, because it's been republished in so many different places now. But if you're a completist, it's a fun thing to pick up. Um, there's even, as is the case with many Star Wars related magazines, including comic runs, right? There's uh, there's also like a preview issue, like an issue zero. And that's always something to keep in mind. Again, for the completists out there, it's often not sufficient just to get, say, like, you know, issues one through 15, because there's often a preview or an issue zero. It's always something to keep in mind. But the next up on the list is 
another one I've done a video on last year, I believe, which is um, 1982's TV Times. Now, TV Times is a, um, or was, I don't know if it still exists, but at the time it was a uh, basically a TV guide for the UK. And um, the big feature, I think it's the October-ish issue of uh, TV Times in 1982, it's advertising the fact that Star Wars, A New Hope, the original Star Wars, was coming to ITV uh, in Britain. So if you were living in the UK at the time, you remember the excitement that you were going to get to watch this again, right, on TV. And ITV was playing that up. There's a great, great illustration of Darth Vader on the cover, sort of a classic image that's available a number of things at the time. But the thing that makes it really important for EU lore is that there's a um, big splash page comic that provides a little bit of insight into some of the characters, as well as the um, the, the uh, destruction of the first Death Star, right? So it's it's uh, sort of an early sort of comic insight into some of the events surrounding that and the people surrounding that. Um, I had been familiar with it for a number of years. There are some websites that are devoted to talking more about it, where, by the way, you can see the, the comic, right? So you don't need to track this down. And unfortunately, it's not really collected anywhere else. It's one of these things that sort of falls in the ambiguous canonicity territory. It's not something that, say, Marvel put out or Dark Horse. It's not necessarily going to get recollected, you know, in some new omnibus. But it's it's a comic about the E that fits within continuity that provides additional insight. It's something that came at a very early point when we had very little to go on. So it's very helpful to have. And it's just a cool nostalgic piece in its own right. But um, it's uh, uh, I was finally able to track down when uh, Eddie Vanderheiden from StarWarsTimeline.com was announcing that to make room, I think, for his growing Doctor Who collection. Uh, speaking of Doctor Who, I got a Doctor Who t-shirt on. Um, he was selling off some of his older Star Wars stuff. I, about as fast as I could, wrote to say, if you are getting rid of the TV Times, please let me be the one to, to buy it. And he made me a really good, a really good offer. But that's something that I, uh, I'd been looking for for years. And uh, I'd, I'd never actually seen available beyond um, beyond the one that uh, I knew he owned because he, he had made a post about it a number of years before. So anyway, very lucky to track that down. Very hard to find. Very, very hard to find, of course. Another thing that maybe some people still have, um, but that maybe people don't know is valuable. And given that it was just basically a TV guide, it, it served you know its function for a week or a month and that's it. It mostly got thrown out, right? Why would you keep this stuff? Um, the next thing is imprint star wars imprint by christy golden 2009 seven page ish um little snippet that relates to fate of the jedi um it came in the hyperspace fan club and um which means there's must be tons of people that have it and it must mean that they want to keep it which is great right but um you very 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 rarely see this um on the secondary market and when it does it's it's you're gonna have to pay hundred bucks maybe for it right is it worth it objectively probably no um you know you can read fate of the jedi without it you can go to the wikipedia article and read what you probably need to know but if you're a completist it's it's a cool thing to have if you weren't a part of the fan club at the time or lost it or what have you so seven pages in print hard to find it's definitely something that and I, i've got it i spent way too much on it but you know, that's just the sickness and the obsession that that is, you know, EU fandom, right? And being and being sort of a, a completist. Um, but for what it's worth, it's about Vestara. I, I, they're definitely I, I know of a number of people who are huge Vestara fans, so it's definitely worth sort of having. Um, and uh, it's a cool conversation starter. You know, a lot of people forget about it, right? A lot of this obscure stuff again just falls back under. Um, some of it's known, but hard to find other stuff it's hard to find because it's not well known and it's just kind of fun right it's uh, the the thing that i like about i think the one good thing about being an obsessive collector is that it you're constantly looking for more things that you didn't even know exist right so in the hunt for the complete collection i've actually discovered some things that you know we didn't know existed right so that's always that's always kind of fun um let's see um what else? There's there's a billion other things I could talk about. I think, I mean, I've got a couple things that come to mind. I didn't even write down. There is this really neat thing that I haven't seen available in years. It's the Dark Empire Collector's Edition. And it was kind of like a CD, um, 
it was like a big package of like CD audio adaptations of all of the Dark Hawk Empire related comics. And so this came out like, when would it have come out? I kind of forget, like early mid nineties, but you know, um, adaptation of Dark Empire, Dark Empire one or one and two, and then Empire's End. Um, it's the sort of thing that back in the day you would have seen like in a Lucasfilm catalog or on earlystarwars.com or something, but that now again, I don't, I don't know why this stuff isn't more available. I don't, and maybe it's because people are holding on to it because they really like it, which again would be really great, but it just doesn't seem like, um, the people who have it like know enough to know to go ahead and put it online because someone would snap it up immediately, right? So that's kind of a cool thing, kind of an obscure thing, a fun thing to have. Again, impossible, not because it's like super needed or at this point, I mean, again, you can get these things in lots of other sort of ways. It's just that like, and again, there's some fairly readily available sort of like adaptations, like audio adaptations of like Dark Empire, which is one that I talked about recently. Um, I love, I used to listen to it all the time. It's got Billy Dee Williams and stuff. But again, some of this stuff, it's uh, it's just, it's it'd be cool to have. It's definitely part of the complete, the, the complete collection. Um, God, what else is there? Um, I, I kind of hinted at this too, but I sort of feel like, I hinted at that the RPG mags, sort of third party RPG mags with, with, you know, related Star Wars content. Some of those are, easy-ish to find, you know, if they were published in um, not so long ago, sort of like mainline North American gaming magazines, right? You know, there's going to be tons of people, in other words, who bought that stuff, not because of Star Wars, but because they're gamers. Tons of people subscribe to that stuff. They have stacks of them in their house. A lot of people are selling them, not knowing that there's Star Wars stuff in them, right? But they're selling them because they know there are other gamers who collect gaming magazines, right? So that makes it nice. But for a lot of those RPG mags, from outside North America, if you're not in North America, good luck, you know, um, because you may find them, but the price of, you know, importing them is going to be super expensive. Shipping's a problem. Um, and again, I think that's maybe like the most acute case, those RPG mags of forget trying to put together the complete collection, even understanding what the complete collection is, what the full checklist is, is a task in and of itself. And I think that I've got a pretty good sense of what that is, but you occasionally discover new things. You know, a lot of this activity took place late 80s through the 90s with a lot of the West End Games material, but there's definitely some things that concern the Wizards of the Coast. You know, there's there's mags that do stuff as late as Revenge of the Sith that relate to some um, RPG scenarios. Um, they're still doing that now, I think, and I, I, I presume with some Fantasy Flight, there's probably still some gaming magazines that, that provide some scenarios with some of the Fantasy Flight stuff, but some of that stuff is pretty sort of like canon, new, like new canon focus, so not entirely the focus of my collection. The one other thing, too, and I think I'll end with this, that I sort of also alluded to, is, is that, you know, um, when you're collecting these runs, never forget, sometimes with magazines, there's like preview issues. With comics, there's like zero issues, too, right? Sometimes... A lot of Dark Horse stuff did this. They'd wrap back around with like a, like you know, um, like a special issue and call it issue zero. So never forget that, right? But when it comes to runs, whether it's of like a book series or um, particularly like a children's book series and stuff, but in particular comic runs, one thing that I've definitely noticed for years is that, and makes a lot of sense. Oftentimes, the first issues, the first couple of issues, are more expensive than lots of the others for a variety of reasons, speculation reasons. Everyone loves number ones and stuff, and also because, you know, maybe they had like a different print run, right? When a new comic gets started, maybe you know, I mean, they're taking a chance, right? So maybe they don't create, you know, maybe they don't publish, you know, a hundred thousand issues, right? You know, so there's just going to be fewer. And the same, of course, is true on the other end, right? When they're ready to cancel the book. Um, you know, there's there's declining readership. They're not gonna again. They're not gonna produce as many. Um, this has been true for years of Star Wars 107, which was until 2019 the final, the final edition of the, the classic Star Wars Marvel run until 108, of course. But um, that's always been a little harder to find, or certainly slightly more expensive than it really should be, right? Relative to the you know the story inside and stuff. So always something to keep in mind. I mean. The, the the sort of the bookends of runs are always going to be slightly harder to find, if not impossible, just harder to find in sort of like a really kind of like inexpensive sort of way. So anyway, what are the things that you find the most impossible or hard to get or the things that are out of the reach? I'd love to know. I'll probably come back and do another video about this as I think of more ideas, but these are some things that um, I've been lucky to track down over the years that, to be totally honest, I'm really glad that I have because I think I'd go crazy now trying to track some of this stuff down. It's just... Um, you could spend years looking for Star Wars imprint and it never pop up or Dig Magazine, right? You know, and I know people who 
to this day, you know, they've got everything except their mission. You're missing, you know, like Star Wars missions number 12 or something. And it's so unfortunate. It's just hard to believe that some of this stuff is so out of reach because there are tons of us, right? There are tons of Star Wars EU fans and we've all been collectors for years. So there are people out there who have it, who probably are willing to get rid of it. They just don't know, right? That there's, there's a similar demand, you know? So, uh, if, uh, if you're in that position, take to eBay, take the secondary market, take that stuff to the used bookstore. If you're not enjoying it, um, you know, give it up. Uh, let uh, others have a chance. And I have to say that's, that's the one reason why, and I, I mentioned this in a live stream recently, it's the one reason why I've resisted um, picking up what for me would be a lot of like the redundant like um, Marvel Epic collections and stuff like that. It looks beautiful. It would be great to have that organized the way they've organized it. I think Marvel's done a great job with that stuff, but it sells out, right? And I don't need it. Other people want it. So I just don't want to put it on my shelf where I'm not going to read it for years, right? Where it's it, it belongs in someone else's sort of collection, right? I, I often think, you know, it's like an Indiana Jones, right? When he says that stuff belongs in a museum, sometimes this stuff belongs in someone else's collection, right? You know, so if you have redundant versions, if you um, if you're really done with it, right, and you don't have like the crazy obsessive collector's bug, hey, consider putting it online and make a little bit of money. Everyone's better off, right? So anyway, I will come back if I can think of more, but let me know what you think are the impossible, hard to find stuff. All right, take talk to you later.